Okay, so today we're going to finish off this uh, Google search lecture. Where we left off last time was talking about one of the problems that uh, Google had as far as determining uh, match relevance or basically determining how to rank search results. So early on, you know, late 90s, Google's uh, way of doing it, they said, you know what, we are going to implement this algorithm called PageRank. And they probably thought it was super funny that they did that. It's kind of a pun because pages, right, like web pages, but who are the founders of Google? Anybody know? Not as famous as Zuckerberg or some of those others, are they? He's one of them. Anybody else? There's another guy. Larry Page. Get it? Page rank? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, funny bastards. All right. So they had this algorithm called page rank, and the idea there is they were trying to mimic a random walk around the internet. So the idea is if you're some random person and not paying too much attention to where you're going or why you're going there, you're just clicking on random links whenever you see them, there's a model you can have where you can figure out the probability of winding up at a particular page. And so they said, you know what, we're going to extend this, and that's how, how we're going to do it. Because you know what, popular pages, more people like popular pages, that's why they're popular. So we're going to make those things show up higher in the search results. Okay? Anyway, it worked pretty well in the late 90s, but problem again, you end up with this circular definition where things are popular because they're popular. And so when new pages come along, that's, a, you know, that's the problem. You can't, you don't have a way to integrate that into the model until they start getting a lot of traffic. And until they get a lot of traffic, or at least, you know, our bigger websites and more things linked to them, they're not going to show up in the web pages, right? So the two factors determining whether a site, uh, whether a page would rank high or not was number one, how many other uh, pages link to it? Because if there are more arrows pointing to that page, of course, it's more likely that a random person will get there. Uh, and the other is basically the size of the website. So a lot of traffic within uh, on the internet tends to be from one page of a website to another. So that kind of automatically, if it's a bigger website, then all the pages on that website are gonna get boosted up a little by that. Other problem besides just, you know, how to introduce new pages, is that that model is really easy for the bad guys to break. All they had to do, they made junky pages on a really big website full of junky pages, and then they cross-linked junky pages from other junky sites to those pages. So, and you didn't need to have like a thousand links pointing to the page. This was the late 90s. So if you had like five or 10, that was actually probably quite a lot. And, you know, if your, search, if your page was packed with, uh, you know, popular search terms, and you had a lot of these junky sites linking to it, guess what? You were going to rank really high in this page rank model. And so, you know, Google had, had to struggle with that. They're like, well, what do we do? All this, you know, our search results, they are not as good as they used to be. This is a problem. We need a smarter mechanism to deal with this. Okay. So that's the thing about uh, page rank. Now, the technical term for those kind of junky pages or junky websites is spam blogs or splogs you might see. So the idea there, you had some people who wanted to make money, but they didn't have any good content, right? They didn't have any uh, interesting articles to write. They didn't have anything to sell retail. They wanna make money just by luring people to a page and hoping they accidentally get accidentally click on an ad you know, that they get paid for. So basic tricks for that. Number one, pack the site text with lots and lots of popular search terms, right? So all the common things that people search for. So famous people, uh, places, you know, years, common words like months, whatever, anything you can think of. If somebody does a Google search for those things, there's a chance your site is gonna contain all those words and rank pretty high, you know, popular movies, whatever. Second thing, they were devious as far as the way that they would go about luring people to the site. So there's a distinction. This was uh, really an early form of what's called search engine optimization. The idea that, or SEO, you may have seen that acronym before. The idea that you can somehow structure your website or web pages to rank higher in search results just by the content that they have. 
And this was an early way to do that, but this is what's considered black hat stuff, right? So if you've ever watched the old uh, movie Westerns, black hats, those are the bad guys, right? The bad guys wear black hats and the good guys wear white hats for some reason. I mean, I, I would think that pretty much everybody would wear brown hats, but you know, being that they're probably made of leather, what do I know? Anyway, I would think. But the black hat technique for this was basically, number one, you might have some really absurdly oversized page, but only a corner of it would be visible to the user and like all this bogus extra text would be around in the peripheral area. Or you could make images, right? And you could hide the text behind the images or you could set the background color to match the text. For example, the background was white, you could write your text in white, but if the text was black, you could make the background color black whatever, right? There were ways so that ordinary people would not see that there was a whole bunch of, you know, unnecessary text on that page. And finally, packed with lots and lots and lots of ads. And they do even little tricks like if you tried to back out of the page, they provide a navigation arrow at the top for you to like back away. But if you hovered over that like you were about to click, just at the last second as you click, the page would drop down and like force you to click on an ad. If people have ever experienced, I see some heads nodding. Yeah, they do, they do uh, stuff like that. Anyway, once upon a time, like 15, 20 years ago, this was very, very common search result clutter, right? A lot of searches, you'd end up with a lot of these spam, spam blogs in the results. But now it's really hard to find uh, unless you actually like dig all the way to the end of the search results. So, and again, I, I used to do this in class. I used to actually try to go to some spam blogs, but lately they've increasingly been not safe for work content. So I, I don't do that. In fact, today I went to the end of a batch of search results uh, on something innocuous, a famous astronomer. And at the end of it, there was somebody's only fans page, which you know I'm sure you've all heard of, but it was just there in the links. I didn't go there, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. So anyway, what Google had to do was do a more sophisticated site analysis, right? They had to come up because it's one thing, any of us, we can just uh, look at a website and say, yep, this is garbage or look at another one and say, this is legit. But Google has to deal with, you know, untold billions of web pages, right? They can't have that human thing. They have to have an automated system that can do it. So basically they were looking at things like the ratio of ads to actual content. They might do grammar analysis on the text there. That's why you see some more advanced spam blogs will have at least semi-coherent sentences, including lots of uh, popular terms. Uh, they had a feature where users could report it. Uh, they looked at user activity data. For example, if a lot of people went to a site and then immediately backed out and nobody ever went to that site twice, you know, things like that would be uh, tells. So anyway, yeah, Google had to do a lot of work to try to filter those out of the search results. Uh, it's a little easier to find these things in Bing, but even Bing is, is decent about getting spam blogs out of the listings. Okay. Now, of course, Google wants to provide uh, relevant results to all users. So in order to do that, it has to continuously monitor lots and lots and lots of web pages. So sometimes the content itself is inherently dynamic, right? Things like uh, today's breaking news. Today's breaking news is going to be different from yesterday's breaking news, right? Or things like sports scores in an ongoing game or stock quotes during trading hours. Stuff like that is all going to be inherently dynamic. Uh, number two, you can have changes to static data, right? Somebody makes an edit to a page, for example. You know, if you're a, uh, a blogger, maybe you make some uh, new article or you edit an old one. If you're Amazon, Maybe there's a bunch of new reviews on a product or maybe some parameters of the product have changed or you've reorganized your site and so there's a different layout to everything. Things like that happen quite a bit. And of course, pages are constantly being created and deleted. So in order to do this, Google has to store a reasonably current replica of the entire surface internet. We'll talk about what the surface internet is in a little more detail, but basically means all the pages that ordinary people can get to. That's good enough for now. Now, even a decade ago, I have an article there that you know talks about how much uh, data Google is crunching out. Google was uh, checking about a trillion URLs, a trillion web addresses, several times a day, right? And there's just a lot more web pages now. Google's index is a whole lot bigger. It's a lot more work. So this is clearly a very big, big data problem, right? The ability to do that many searches 
and gather the results, check them for updates, and you know, integrate it into the system so that people can use it fairly uh, immediately. This is a whole big problem. All right. Now, as far as what Google does, the, the general process is pretty easy to understand. So the first step is crawling. Crawling means Google sends out these uh, software agents, little browser, uh, they're called spiders or Google bots, sends out those browser agents to check web pages. Okay, it checks the web pages, it gathers all their data, it sends that data back to Google. Boom, Google has the web page. The second part is indexing. So when Google gets a new web page, it has to look and see if that page is going to make some change to its index, right? For example, suppose the text of the page has changed, that maybe that page used to be in some index entries, it no longer is, maybe it is going to be added to some new index entries, whatever, okay? And then Google has the data and stores this data in a variety of forms, right? So obviously one form is Google has the index entries themselves, which are basically terms and a long list of pages containing those terms. The second one, Google has extracted data from the page that it uses for ranking. So there's a different system that uh, holds all of that data that's already been extracted from the web pages. So that Google has it right there. It doesn't have to scan through the entire page for every search. And finally, Google also retains complete web pages. Uh, reasons number one, if it wants to update its algorithm, it kind of needs to have that page data available. If it wants to include some new variables about what's in the page, or if it wants to, if it Google already, you know, has a page in its index and the browser bot sends in another page, Google has to be able to look at it and say, oh, is this page a copy of an existing one or what, right? Because one thing that often happens, you'll have multiple copies of the same page content on different URLs, right? To make it accessible through a variety of mechanisms. Or it could be that Google has already, you know, checked out that page, goes back to check it again, like an hour or two later, needs to be able to see, is this page, you know, different in, in any way from the copy we have on hand, okay? So indexing entails all of that kind of stuff. And last, retrieval. Retrieval just means when a search query comes in, Google does all the work to find the pages that match, and from those pages, deliver the uh, set of the top few hundred uh, matches. So that's it. That's pretty much all the stuff that goes on. And I do have a couple links down there if anybody's interested. These are fairly uh, quick and readable, but unfortunately, they are also very brief. They don't contain much more than the bullet points there, but yeah. Okay. Hmm? Hmm. Okay. So again, Google has software agents that visit pages, gather their links and other data, and these agents are called crawlers or spiders, okay? Google calls them Google bots, but generically they're called crawlers or spiders. And that's why this activity is called crawling. So after a page is visited, Google also links, uh, Google also scans any pages that it's linked to. So eventually what happens is that Google will have a graph basically of the entire surface internet. So screen. Let's do a thing here. All right, so suppose hypothetically Google send in some bots to Amazon.com. Okay, so it goes to the home page, right? The bot first goes there, and on this page there are links to a number of other things, right? There's, I mean, I'm not going to put in the entire link. That would be kind of crazy, but uh, maybe there's a link to a contact us page, maybe there is a link to, uh, let's say books or music or movies, right? Let's say those are the three things. Ah, uh, you know what? I'll even make a link for AWS. Do that too. And each one of these, so the spider, it goes to Amazon. Great. And then it says, okay, I've gathered Amazon's page. There are five links here and I'm going to go check this page. Well, it turns out that maybe this movies page also links to a bunch of other pages. So one by one, you know, it goes through those or it adds them to the list and then goes through music. Like I said, music could have links, books could have links, contact us could have links, AW could have links, right? But in some way, you know, it's kind of their special sauce. We don't know exactly how uh, Google does it. It might say, oh, I'm on the movies page. 
great, I'm going to follow all these links. Or it might do the, uh, you know, the second level of links first and then do the third level and so on. It doesn't really matter. In the end, it's going to search all those pages, right? That, that's what the spiders do. So they search a page. If it has links, they also search the pages that are linked to it. Now, Google does, of course, schedule repeat visits, right? Because we know that sometimes pages change. So the question is, how often do you do that? Well, Google doesn't really want to send out a spider because, you know, the spiders are busy. They got a lot of stuff to do. Google doesn't really want to send them out unless they think it's a, there's a decent chance that the uh, page has been updated in some way. So number one, it's based on popularity, right? If there is a page that has been updated and it's a very popular page, that's gonna make a lot of difference to how happy Google's users are, right? They, Google's users want current relevant data. So if the page is popular, gets a lot of traffic, that's a lot more important for Google to have that up to date than you know, some blog that's getting like three views a year, right? Google can take its time uh, updating that one and nobody's gonna care very much. Second, reliability. So. If a page is always up and running, the website that it's on is always up and running, Google knows that somebody cares about that page, right? If it's a retail site, you know, they're out there, they're trying to make money, it's probably legitimate. Uh, if it's something else, you know, at least it, it's there all the time, Google knows that somebody's paying attention to it. But if it's a junkie site, one of the signs of a junkie site is that it's off and down. Right. People say, well, yeah, you know, we'll we'll update this stuff. We'll get to it. Maybe they haven't paid the uh, hosting service that's holding the pages. Maybe they're doing something else with their servers. And because it's not it's not like a retail site that kind of has to be up all the time. It's some kind of junkie site that they just hope people accidentally click on an ad. It doesn't really have to be up all the time to make that much difference in its business model. You know, so that's one of the signs. If it's not on a reliable uh, server, if it's not on a reliable URL and Google often goes there and find that the page is unavailable, then yeah, Google's going to say nobody cares about this page. If you don't care, then Google doesn't care either. And last, update frequency. So pages that are updated very often are going to trigger more frequent uh, visits from Google, right? Because Google wants to keep current stuff. But if Google visits a page, you know, six times a day, every day for a month, and there's never any updates, at some point, Google is going to say, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll check back in like a week or a month or something, and we'll see if there's anything new, right? But if there aren't many changes, then yeah, Google's not going to worry too hard about that because there's a lot of pages that never really change much. Anyway, so those are the basic ideas with how the, uh, the updates are scheduled. Okay, now a Googlebot, again, basically a program that visits pages and copies their content. It's pretty simple as these things go. It's basically a, uh, a networked browser program, so it can go read a web page and then transmit that data to Google, and then to Google's indexing system specifically. So doesn't do any processing beyond reading the content, checking the links. It might do some stuff to see if it's you know a good page or a bad page, but probably that stuff happens internally at Google. Uh, and then again, delivers that content to Google's indexing system. So that the, you know, it becomes the indexing system's problem at that point. The sp spider's just going out, grabbing web pages, following the links, getting new web pages. But sites can include a robots.txt file that specifies content that spiders should ignore. So reason for this, right, this is a bit of an advanced concept here, but I'm gonna do it, screen. Okay, so why even have a robots.txt file, right? Why specify any content as not relevant to search, right? Well, first example, suppose you have a page about a news article, a news event, right? With comments below. Are visitors looking for the news or for the comments? 
Well, unless the comments are really entertaining, right? Once in a while that happens. They're probably just going to that page for the news, right? So most likely just for the news. So it would make sense to include the comment section as, you know, a non factor in the robots.txt file. All right, so they would say, you know, don't consider these comments for purposes of, uh, you know, search ranking. Now, the second thing you might ask, but why? Wouldn't it automatically be better for the site to be listed on, for as many searches as possible? Right? Maybe some of you are thinking that. You're like, well, what do I care if there's extra words? You just told me that spam blogs pack their things with extra words, right? Well, the problem is this. Google also tracks how well a page performs as far as clicks in search results. So if your page is irrelevant in search results, that will tend to push your page down for all searches, okay? So, you know, suppose this is, uh, you know, some news article about, you know, tornado warning or something, and you want people to be able to search tornado warning Northern Illinois and find this relevant stuff. But if your page also starts coming up on a bunch of unrelated stuff because of people's comments, what's gonna happen is, uh, your page might start showing up in search results for those other searches, but since nobody's clicking on them, it'll basically make your page seem bad to Google kind of across the board, right? Google will just say, yeah, this isn't a great page. Not a lot of people are clicking on it. So you'd be mixing in your good results, people clicking on it, trying to find the news about the tornado with the bad results, people just ignoring it because it shows up uh, in an article about people shopping for puppies or something. Okay. All right. Anyway, so th that's why. That's why you would bother excluding that because you want to have your site rank higher in most cases. Okay. Now, here we are. We're up to the point of the structure of the internet. We'll talk about the deep web and the dark web and some of that scary stuff. Okay, so this here, this is this box is the whole internet. The internet. Okay, we're going to divide the internet into two parts. So on top, we are going to have the surface web. The surface web, you can think about it as basically being public content. Okay, so anything that is open to any viewer, not behind a paywall or security feature or for, you know, Google's purposes in a robots.txt file, right? So basically anything that, uh, Pages that Google would index as basically the surface web. Okay, so that's the idea. Again, this is stuff that's you know open to anybody. Second, we have the deep web. The deep web is non-public content for a variety of reasons. Uh, pages that are hidden behind security, right? So for like your email account. Okay, any of that stuff that obviously you would want to keep private. Uh, anything behind a paywall, right? So if a newspaper says, after you've read the first paragraph, you see the little pop up and it says, Oh, if you would, you know, our newspaper needs help, please subscribe. We need to make money. You've reached your article limit for the month. 
you know, if you want to read more, please subscribe for only $2 a month. Okay. Anything behind the paywall is considered uh, part of the deep web as well. And any content specified in a robots.txt file. Okay. So all that is deep web, you know, not going to be pages. Google would not index. You wouldn't want Google to show up your bank account page or your email page in its ordinary search results so the whole world could look at it, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's surface web, that's deep web, but now we get to the scary one. And if you've watched any of those, you know, crime shows, you always have people talking about the dark web. Yeah, I know. Ooh, dark. Well, there is some bad shit going on there, that's for sure. Um, that doesn't look real good. We'll go with pink again. Orange? I want orange. That's not bad. Dark web. Okay. What happens in the dark web, there is anonymized, anonymized access for reaching sites and posting site content. Right? So for the sites themselves, it's anonymized as well. Often criminal or very questionable, right? This, this is content that uh, should probably be avoided, uh, but not always, uh, but yeah, often criminal or questionable. So we'll, we'll talk about this. Not everything on the dark web is illegal, but yeah, okay. So the deep web, again, all those things on the pages that all those pages that are not indexed by search engines, right? So we, in specified in robots.txt files or hidden behind paywalls or various types of secured content, those would all be considered deep web. The dark web is a different beast. The dark web is designed for anonymous usage. Does anybody know the origins of the dark web? Close, military is a good guess was actually designed by American espionage services. Because if you have your spies overseas and they want to communicate via internet, they don't really want to have their messages intercepted in that country, do they? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so that, that's where it came from. And the two tools for that, number one, the Tor browser, right? So Tor browsers, use what's called onion routing. Essentially, every time you go from one uh, place to a, the next on the internet, your browser encapsulates your identity in some kind of wrapper that the next website doesn't really see. They just see the, uh, the outer one. You know, they don't see any of the stuff on the inside. So they can send a message to you, to that, you know, fake address, and your browser maintains all the details that, oh, we have to do it through this uh, transformation and this transformation and this transformation to eventually get it to the correct IP address, right? So all the, that different set of, uh, you know, encryption basically handles that. So any individual site you're talking to does not have that information about who you are. The other side, of course, is I2P. So again, one of the well-known things about the dark web is the Silk Road that I'm sure some of you have heard of. Uh, Silk Road was basically for trying to sell drugs over the internet. Right. Uh, and if you're doing that, if you're in the market for a brick of cocaine or something, you know, you don't you don't really want to have your identity being public on the Internet. You know, you don't want Comcast to be tracking that. So, yeah, you find some way to be hidden. Likewise, if you are the dude selling that brick of cocaine, you don't really want to, you know, go to GoDaddy.com and, you know, get your site address and say, oh, yeah, we're selling coke here. Right. So not a good thing. So anyway, I2P is anonymous website hosting, right? So the same kind of idea, people can send website content to a place, but wherever it's stored, you know, and however it's displayed, it usually cannot be tracked back to the original source. Now, having said that, this, I, I again, strongly advise everyone to stay out of this stuff. Uh, I'm sure some of you will be like, oh yeah, this sounds like my kind of thing, but Number one, even though it is, you know, it, it's basically not possible to track people 
through this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, if, you know, they want to exert a tremendous amount of effort basically cracking the uh, encryption stuff on this, they might be able to do it, but it'd be a lot of work. And in fact, this guy, the Silk Road guy, it's a, it's a fun article there. It's, it's very readable. The way they found him was they said, you know, here's a basic problem of anonymous uh, websites and anonymous users. How do you advertise your drug dealing website? You can't like put a billboard by the side of the highway, right? And you can't like do legit advertising. So you can't, you know, run ads on Google, say, hey, you're looking for drugs, come to Silk Road, right? That you'll get caught. So how do you do it? Well, the FBI th gave some thought to that. And they said, you know, if we were doing this kind of site and we wanted to reach out to likely customers, we would probably post on a whole bunch of message boards all over the internet. And we'd say stuff like, hey guys, I just found this really cool site called Silk Road. They sell lots of great stuff there, things you wouldn't think you could sell on the internet. You should go check it out. And the FBI said, you know, we'll go back in time and we'll find the earliest one of those and whoever put up the very first ad on the, you know, mention on the very first message board, if that's not the guy who originated the business, it's probably like part of his inner circle. And, you know, we can take him away and, you know, whatever till he gives us some names, right? Is what they thought. Now, as it happened, that's exactly what they did. And they followed, you know, the IP address, the identity of that first message and boom, led him straight to the guy. That was him. So that's how they caught him. Uh, also, a few years ago, there was a child pornography ring out of uh, South Korea that, again, we're using this kind of anonymized uh, web hosting. But what happened, one of the dudes, uh, one of the, even though the content is anonymized, one of the pages actually included the actual server's IP address, right? So for some reason, it was just hard coded into the page. And they said, oh, look at that. That's an IP address in South Korea. We can find that guy. So they went there, boom, found him. The server was still there, cracked the ring, you know, several dozen people, you know, doing a lot of time in prison now. So anyway, they're probably not going to catch you as an ordinary user, but if, yeah. So anyway, I advise against it. That is my public service announcement for the day. Dark web, dark web, dark web exists. I do not recommend participating in it. Okay. Now, Google stores a whole bunch of different kinds of data related to its index. The one, the big, the obvious one is the index itself, right? And every index entry is a term or set of terms and a list of all the pages containing that term or set of terms. So that's one, right? And it uh, also, it pulls out a bunch of data from the pages. It extracts data from the, the web pages to do faster uh, ranking of pages. So things like particular text, location of text, you know, whether it's in a header or the title or some ordinary thing, and how terms are combined together in various ways. Google has all of that information kind of pre-computed because it doesn't want to do it. You know, a lot of searches tend to recur and Google doesn't really want to have to do them all from scratch every time. Uh, also images and videos, right? Google also uh, indexes images, indexes videos. For example, for the you know, picture pineapple, it could have a list of all the images with the tag pineapple in their metadata. And it also keeps page metadata. So for example, when a Googlebot sends an, a copy of a page to Google's indexing system, Google needs to see if it already has, you know, an identical pre-existing page. And if the page does exist, Google needs to know what the timestamp on that page was so it can compare and say, oh, how long has it been? You know, we have this page from two hours ago, and here's a, an updated one. So they can have that frequency of change information. So things like that, besides just the basic uh, index itself, Google stores that kind of uh, pre-processed data. And again, also stores complete web pages. So the main repository for all this is on a variety of document servers. Uh, basically think of them as kind of like key value stores, right? So it's just, they maintain long lists and long sets of documents, whether they're the raw web pages itself or whether uh, you know there are these index entries that are effectively documents. Anyway, because just like web pages, some of the index entries may be very large, some of them may be very small. Uh, 
And we'll talk more about uh, how Google uh, how Google stores its uh, pre-processed data. They have another system called Bigtable for that, but we'll talk about that next lecture. Now, it's pretty easy to understand the basic principles of indexing. So imagine that you have a library full of books and you want to find information on some topic, right? You want to look up the, uh, I don't know, the history of bowling. So you would not scan every book in the library, would you? That would be kind of crazy. I say crazy, as I, I, I want to tell the story because I, I remember this from a few years back. This was pre-COVID. So those of you who knew me back when knew that I would drink a lot of uh, Pepsi Max, but since COVID, I switched to coffee for reasons that are unclear to me. Uh, but I used to drink a lot of Pepsi Max, which is now Pepsi Zero, but I had this, I had just bought a two liter because I was out at home and while I was on my way to the train station, I had a two liter. And I didn't want to leave it on the floor because the floor is dirty. So I'm eating my lunch and I got this two liter on the counter next to me. And this old woman wanders by and she asks me, are you going to drink that whole soda with your meal? Because I didn't have another drink. It's like Panda Express or something. It's got like celery and onions and you don't really need water with that because, you know, there's enough veggies to fix it. And I said, no, that would be insane, which it would. But she got all, she was, she said, she stopped for a second and then she's like, you know, you should be really careful using that term. I am a registered nurse and people who blah, 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 and they have problems and they deserve sympathy and it's not something to just, and I was like, look, lady, I'm just trying to eat my lunch here. I, I felt like bad Santa. I don't know. It's, anyway, so yeah, so when I say that would be crazy to scan every book, that's the anecdote that, uh, yeah, so I'm not making fun of mental illness, but it would be like a really inefficient way to live your life, to search every book in the library. Anyway, what you would do instead you would build an index, right? You would have, just like they have in libraries. Back in the day, they had the card catalog, which is a physical, like, mini file cabinet full of these little cards that had the books. Nowadays, of course, it's digital. But you have this index to help guide you to a much smaller subset of relevant books, right? You could say books about bowling or books about history. Or you could just type in history bowling and get all the book titles that contain both or have it in their tags, whatever. And it's the same thing at Google, fundamentally. Right, the architecture details, of course, are different, but the basic idea that you do this little bit of overhead work in advance to make it a whole lot easier to get searches done, that's the same thing. So again, for every search term, the index holds a list of pages containing that term, and if there are multiple search terms, right, if you write a long query with many terms, there's gonna be a, only a relatively small set of web pages that holding all, hold all of them. But still, like we saw, searches for common terms can very easily roll up into the millions. So the next question, Google's trying to do something different. So Google is shifting, and they have been for some time, So, but they're, they're still working on it. They're trying to do a pure semantic approach to search results. So the idea with this, with semant semantics is basically meaning of words, so word meanings. And what Google wants to do, they recognize that exact text matches are not always great. Right? They're not going to do a good job of actually delivering what people are looking for. Because why? Because if you insist on saying the only pages we're going to return are ones that actually have these terms, it might not show up well. Right. So, for example, suppose ah, suppose you want to do a search for the five best restaurants in Chicago, okay? What you actually want for that is a short list of good restaurants, right? Not necessarily an article including those exact words. Right? We can understand that this, this is a thing. Likewise, the example I, I often do, 17th century scientists. Anybody know any 17th century scientists? I'll take 17th century for a thousand. What's that? I believe he was earlier. But perhaps he was. I believe he was earlier. We're going to look up Francis Bacon. 
Oh, no. Yeah, I guess technically made it to 1626. So, okay, I'll give you Francis Bacon. Yeah, I don't keep all these dates in my head, right? So, yeah, Francis Bacon, very nice. He did not, by the way, invent bacon. He did a bunch of stuff. I, I, Off the top of my head, I don't know. But he's, for one thing, I think he's been credited with having written some of Shakespeare's plays. But yeah, he did science-y stuff too. Galileo, right? You guys have heard of Galileo. Who is generally credited with uh, having invented calculus? Isaac Newton, there you go. So Newton, by the way, Newton, quite possibly one of the smartest people to ever live, died a virgin. So something to think about. Um, what else, right? But the point is, right, science fact. Uh, the point is, all these guys, if you're looking for 17th century scientists just to kind of get a cross-section of who was doing stuff, right, and you Googled 17th century scientists, again, you're not wanting to find a page and only the pages that contain the words 17th century scientists, right? It's like 17th century scientists is an umbrella for a bunch of different things. So the way Google processes this with what's called natural language processing, it tries to understand what the things are about. It understands there are two things. There's one 17th century, which is a time range, and there's scientists, which is a profession. And so, you know, and we'll say including astronomy, biology, chemistry, et cetera, right? All those kind of things. And so if you can find some people that they were around in that time and they're noted for their achievements in one of these fields, they'll get bundled into that heading, right? And that's the sort of analysis that Google can actually do to provide much more relevant search results, right? If it just looked at pages that said 17th century scientists, yeah, there's probably a few of them out there, but, right? It's going to be only a small subset and maybe not really what you're looking for. So Google has what's called the knowledge graph. If we do this very thing, 17th century scientists, okay? It brings up a bunch of uh, links at the top and you can find out some of you know these guys, what they did, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so this is, these are what are called knowledge cards. It's a way where, you know, Google can, uh, you know, arrange that information conveniently for you. Okay. And Google maintains what's called a knowledge graph to show all the relationships between all those different concepts, right? So it can show 17th century as a time range corresponding to certain years in the Western world's calendar. And it can understand scientists as a person who has some kind of achievement in one of these subfields of science, you know, so the computers would be smart enough to recognize that someone who has discovered a new element would probably be a scientist. Someone who came up with a new theory of gravity would be a scientist, okay? So anyway, content gets then understood by Google in a combination of term associations, object structures, and it can look and see these guys are 17th century scientists and return information about those. And again, Google has been working hard on this for about 10 years. Uh, a little bit even further back than that, but that's that's when it got big. They did a, uh, a new engine called uh, Hummingbird that was really driven around this sort of semantic analysis. And very quickly when they brought it out, they found it was it was worthwhile. And about 90% of their searches were involving some semantic elements. And you know they they want to go all the way to that point uh, to 100%, but you know I, I don't think they're quite there yet. There's still you know, a fair number of searches that just are for exact terms. Yeah. I mean, semantic what? Yeah, but you're looking at the meaning of words, not just the exact text matches. Yep. That's what they're trying to do. Yep. Okay. Next thing, retrieval, right? So, when a search arrives, Google has to look through the terms in its index to find matching pages, right? So if a user enters the words history bowling or bowling history, it's gonna, Google's gonna say, oh, here's the index entry for bowling, here's the index history for 
uh, his index entry for history. Let's look through those and find out which pages are contained in both. Those are probably going to be pretty good matches. Okay. Now, of course, we know that nowadays there's also, uh, you know, synonyms. There are also, you know, uh, you can have search results returned that maybe only contain one word but not the other. So it's not, again, not a perfect uh, exact text match like it used to be, but Google's trying to deliver the best results. And the algorithm itself, this is definitely one of Google's special sauces, so they're not going to go and tell everybody exactly how it works. Part of it is because, you know, it's a trade secret and they don't want to just give that away. Number two, because they don't really want bad guys to know exactly how the algorithm works so that they can try to manipulate it and have junky pages rank higher again. And number three, because the algorithm is really complex and it changes all the time anyway, right? They're constantly refactoring it and very possibly, very probably using variations on the algorithm for different kinds of pages as well. I mean, from the outside, we just don't know. Anyway, but we can talk about some general principles, right? So obviously, number one, term matches are good. Uh, if the terms appear on the page in the same sequence as they do in the search query, Obviously, that's pretty good as well. Uh, Google's also going to concern uh, consider term groups with distinct meanings, right? So bowling history is arguably a semantic unit, arguably not, right? So when we say bowling history, it's not like a special standalone thing. Yeah, sure, it means history of bowling, but it's not really different from the words bowling and history together. Uh, again, the distinction would be... Uh, well, we're, we're in the market for uh, some new laundry hardware. So we got to get a new washer and a new dryer. And we were considering Whirlpool, but we went with another brand. But if you said, you know, Whirlpool dryer, Whirlpool is a word. And you know what a Whirlpool is, right? Spiral going down. And everybody knows what a dryer is. Dryer. But Whirlpool dryer specifically means one manufactured by Whirlpool. So arguably that would be more of a semantic unit. So again, term group with a distinct meaning. We'll talk more about this in indexing and retrieval. It's the whole next lecture. We go into more detail. And of course, different text, different objects, different metadata. So for example, suppose Google has recognized that some search like for buy dishwasher, uh, buy, buy dryer or buy new dryer, Google has recognized that that probably means people are going to want to go to retail sites, right? Because they're looking to buy a new dryer. It's not like they want information about how to buy a new dryer, or they're just looking for random pages that have those three words. Google's smart enough to recognize, oh, yeah, they probably want a dryer. We're going to guide them to retail pages. So to that end, they can look for pages that have, you know, for example, images of dishwashers that have uh, drop-down menus where you can select options. It's a known retail site, has a shopping cart, stuff like that. Those are what we talk about, you know, the objects, the metadata. Those are factors that can uh, drive, you know, whether a particular page gets included at the top with search results. Okay. Now, as far as result prioritization, basic question is, you're going to have a lot of pages that all have the search terms, right? The Internet is so big and there's so many pages and whether artificially or not, for pretty much any set of search terms you're going to come up with, there's going to be a bunch of pages that have those terms. So the question is, how should they be ordered? How should the search results be ranked? So way back when, you know, 1998 or so, it was pretty much just the frequency, prominence, co-location of terms, right? If the pages had all those terms, then the next thing it could look at is how many times they repeated, where they were kept, you know, and if they were in the proper order. So ideally, you know, if there was a page that was packed uh, with search, those, those search terms, it was probably all about that topic, you know, so maybe that was better. Also, Google had the page rank algorithm. So pages that had more links going to them were assumed to be more important. But like we talked about, that model is very easily broken. So Google's next thing was to do things, not strings. So we know what a thing is. It's a thing. And a string is a general uh, computer programming term for a slug of text. So what Google is trying to do is rank search results not on the basis of the exact text they contain, so not strings, but on the things that the strings represent, right? So if you do a search for 17th century scientists, 
Google doesn't want to return you just the pages that contain those words. It wants to con return you pages that contain information that Google considers to be 17th century scientists, right? Guys like Newton and Galileo and Francis Bacon and all the rest. Okay. So yeah, so Google tries to mimic how humans search. It groups text, groups objects into comparison units. For example, if Google knows that you're looking for a retail site to buy some shoes, well, if it has the word shoe or shoes and it has some images and it has a price, you know, Google can recognize some text that's preceded by a currency symbol. Uh, if there's a drop down menu with uh, sizes, styles, whatever, and there's a shopping cart, Google's going to say, yeah, this looks like a retail site. This, this makes sense. This is probably what we should send. Google's going to say, you know, shoes. You're not going to look at, you know, the history of shoes or how to make your own shoes, right? If you're Googling for shoes, you probably want to buy some. Okay. And of course, there's adaptive relevance because relevance changes over time, right? Over time, uh, users can associate search terms with different goals, different outcomes. So sometimes the difference is inherent in the terms itself. If somebody is looking for weather in a particular zip code, if I Google weather 60601, what sort of time interval for weather do you think I'm probably going to see? Not from 1992? Probably not, right? Yeah. Right. So if you're searching for weather, Google knows that, oh, people who search for weather tend to want some sort of near term forecast, right? Either the weather for today or maybe a three or five or seven or 10 week forecast, something like that. That's what people are looking for. Okay. Likewise, if you're looking for stock price for Pfizer, PFE there, by default, Google is going to assume that asking a question about a stock price without any other information, you want the current stock price, right? Not, again, the stock price from 1992. Uh, other stuff, search terms and the results change over time, right? So if you looked in 2021, if you did a Google search for Russia-Ukraine conflict, you'd probably get some stuff like World War II, where Ukrainian and Russian units were working together within the Soviet Union to do war stuff. If you, uh, or you might find some stuff about the famine that Ukraine uh, had inflicted on it in around 1930. You might find some stuff about that. Uh, but 2022, you know, for every article about history stuff, now there's 100 articles and 100 pairs of eyeballs looking at, you know, current events for the ongoing fight there. So very, very different. And Google has to incorporate that in order to deliver, you know, relevant search results. So it can't just say, oh yeah, this other content was, has been relevant for the last 20 years, but still something new comes along and it has to take over pretty quickly. And you can have local variations too, based on, you know, geographic location. So for example, suppose the Kardashians are coming to downtown Chicago for some big event, right? Well, if you're doing that search for Kardashians in Chicago, Google would probably recognize, oh, people in Chicago, they're going to very different links than people anywhere else on the world when they search Kardashians. But maybe on the West Coast or East Coast, you know, you'd still prioritize whatever clothes or other stuff they happen to be selling that week. Okay, so they would get their, their regular stuff. Anyway, Google combines historical information about what you've done, about what the world as a whole has done, and predictive models, you know, what they think is going to happen going forward to try to deliver the most relevant results, right? So if there's a term that's sharp, sharply trending up, like, you know, the day that Russia invaded Ukraine, you know that, you know, Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, started spiking in the search results. Google very quickly says, oh, yeah, that's a big one. We're going to, you know, deal with that. But it has to be done in an automated way, right? It's not just some human pushing buttons saying this search is going to lead to these web pages because there's too many web pages and too many terms to do that. Okay. Another thing, user history. So Google search now uh, factors your recent searches into the results, right? So if you go to Google, let's do it. If you go to Google and just search for what, Google will suggest some options for you. We're going to try this. Huh. What is martial law? What time is it? What is monkeypox? Whatever. What is my IP? That one's always in there. Everybody wants to know their IP address. Okay. But what? What a burger? Yeah. People like burgers. Yeah. I read an article. Oh, has anybody tried the ghost 
pepper burger at Burger King? They have a ghost pepper burger now. Ghost pepper Whopper, yeah. I gotta try that, I'll let you know. <laughs> I was reading this article there, though, that said uh, it, it was very anti-Burger King. It was like, Burger King is far inferior to its competitors, McDonald's and Wendy's. And I, I don't know, I don't know about that. I, I like Burger King, but Wendy's, I mean, the food tastes fine. They actually have a really nice chicken sandwich now, but I, I can't get around the deviant square burgers. That's just, that freaks me out. Anyway, some people like it though, whatever. Not my business. Anyway, but if you type in, start doing some stuff around Ethernet, right? Ethernet for wired connections, then you'll see a different batch. So if I do something like Ethernet, ah, and then I go back and I type what is, then it updates it, right? It says not only, you know, Ethernet, but a whole bunch of stuff related to Ethernet. So LANs and routers and networking and blah, 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 all this other stuff. What is hub? There are no hubs. Hubs are, hubs are obsolete. Okay. Anyway, so the algorithm, again, it's complex, it's secret, but we know a few things, general principles. Number one, it's supported by your search history. So whatever stuff you have searched for in the past, that's the stuff that is going to be, you know, suggested to you. Number two, it is supported by actual clicks. So if there are links that people actually click on, that is very quickly going to, you know, have a major impact on how this uh, historical information is uh, assessed. And the rankings, they include not only your individual patterns, but also global preferences, right? So when you do that stuff like what is, and you start getting all these popular ones like, you know, what is my IP, stuff like that, that's because a lot of other people around the world have made those searches over time. So, all right, last bit, Google Instant. So Google Instant is a predictive technology. Google's trying to uh, suggest ways for you to close out your search. So once you start typing in a search query, right, it's gonna suggest additional words based on what you already typed, okay? And again, it works basically the same, but let's let's try a simple one. I'm going to do New York, ooh, Yankees. I was expecting city, but you never know. Not New York City. That's interesting. Screen, yeah. All right, I, I was expecting New York City, but you never know, right? So New York Yankees. All right, I wonder how the Yankees are doing. Oh, don't really follow baseball. Anyway, okay, so again, you type in some simple phrases like the what is or the who is or the why does. There was a who is today. So you guys know who Jeffrey Dahmer is. Yeah, so there's a series about him, I guess, now. Uh, anyway, so back in 1991, when he was killing all those, or when he got caught for killing all those people, uh, there was also a movie in the theaters called uh, Boys in the Hood. Some of you may have seen it, maybe not. Yeah. Anyway, so the joke was, oh, yeah, they're going to be making a mo new movie about Dahmer. And they're like, really? What is it? Oh, it's going to be called Boys in the Freezer. Yeah, so... That's what that's what people did in the nineties. That's what yeah, that's what we did then. Anyway. Yeah. So uh anyway, how this works, how Google Instant works, again, basically just simple statistics. The most popular add-ons are the ones that Google's gonna show you, right? Mostly just popular term combinations. However, there is some filtering against defamatory or not safe results, right? So the not safe for work is pretty obvious. If, you know, people have their kids doing some research for a school report and they say, you know, you don't want to have porn suggestions show up for them, obviously. But the other one, this uh, link here from 2016. So you guys remember there was an election in 2016 and it was Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump. And at some point in the election, there was a, uh, a whole big thing around Hillary's private uh, email server, right? You guys, you know, that, that thing happened. Okay, so that's the history for this. And if you try to do that Google search, if you try to do Hillary Clinton email, oh, server, I was going to do server, serve, right? Nothing shows up. Why is that? It's not suggesting anything. And so the Trump side, they were saying, hey, our people were trying to find information about Hillary's server and they couldn't find anything. And look, this just proves that Google and big tech are in the tank for her. And, you know, I mean, obviously 
you know, it, it's well known that uh, the tech people were obviously very vocally anti-Trump. I don't know how much they liked Hillary, but same thing. If you look up uh, Donald Trump, Russia, collusio, still nothing, right? So it's not, you know, a left or right thing. It's not a politics thing. What it is is that Google just doesn't want to deal with the legal hassles of potentially getting sued by guiding people to information. I mean, you can still run the search, right? You can still find, yeah, collusion. You can find all that stuff if you want, and you can still find Hillary Clinton server, right? You can find all that stuff too, but they're not going to suggest it to you, right? You actually have to fill in the words yourself. Okay. Anyway, so that's what I got. That's good. We finished our stuff, which is also good. So we are done. Questions on any of this? Does it all make a lot of sense? I hope it does. All right. So like I said, later tonight, I'll post that stuff for the next lecture. And then have a good weekend. We'll see you some other time.